my name is Keith Dunn. It's my great honor and privilege to serve as the provost and dean of the college at Millsaps. Uh, and I'm not going to speak very long at all, so we can make much uh, a great amount of time uh, for the panelists. I would like to thank Dr. John Bauer, who is not with us today, but was with us last night for the uh, uh, award ceremony, which is always the award ceremony in the lecture series is one of the real highlights of my year. Uh, it, it's one of the best things Millsaps does. And I know President Perrigan feels the same way, uh, and he expresses his uh, uh, his regrets that he's not able to be here. He's, he's on the road uh, last night and, and again today. But it's great to welcome you here, and I would like to thank Dr. Bauer uh, for being so generous with the endowment that he established uh, to support the Rabbi Nussbaum uh, lecture series and award series. Uh, and it's a great privilege for Millsaps to be able to partner with him in this way. Um, for the first time that, uh, that since I've been here, and I, this is my eighth year, I think we have all Millsaps folks as our honorees. Uh, Margaret, we're going to claim you, as I, as I said, <laughs> said last night, for a couple of reasons. One is because uh, you have an honorary degree from Millsaps in 2008. <laughs> Uh, but more importantly, your, your father was a, a, a great and iconic uh, philosophy professor here, and you grew up on the grounds in what I learned last night, uh, the origins of why it was called Faculty Row, um, and just behind the, the Christian Center. Uh, but all four of our honorees this year uh, were Millsaps folks. Uh, and if, in case you haven't seen the, um, uh, the, the program, they are Martha Burtman, who is one of our panelists today, Rob McDuff, um, Dr. Stephanie Rolfe, who is here with us today, and Karam Rahat, who is a fairly recent uh, graduate of Millsaps. So uh, just a quick moment to congratulate all of our award winners. Karam, that was absolutely uh, perfect timing. <laughs> Wave to the crowd, please. Uh, <laughs> we just congratulated you. <laughs> and I'm going to turn the, uh, the program over to our moderator. Uh, Kenneth Townsend is another uh, outstanding example of a Millsaps education, and he is currently our executive director of the Institute for Civic and Professional Engagement and teaches in our political science program. Yeah. Great. Great. Thanks, Keith. Uh, good to see all of you this uh, afternoon. Welcome to Millsaps. This is a real treat for me. I have um, known about these folks for a long time, and uh, to have the chance to moderate this conversation is a true honor. You don't really want to hear that much from me, so what I'm going to do is read some uh, brief biographical um, information regarding our two panelists. And then I'm going to join them on this table, and we've got some questions that we're going to work our way through that I think will provide for some pretty rich uh, conversation and reflection. And then at the end, we'll leave a bit of time for audience Q&A, so be prepared to jot down any notes if you'd like to get to. Okay, so uh, Martha Bergmark is the founding executive director of Voices for Civil Justice. Over four decades, Martha has been a leader in the movement to fulfill America's promise of justice for all. During her tenure as its founding president, uh, the Mississippi Center for Justice became an influential force for progressive change, scoring significant policy and litigation wins, and growing to a $4 million annual budget with a staff of 28 and three offices, including some people here in the audience today. Welcome, MCJ folks. Um, she continues to serve the Center for Justice as a board member and senior counsel. She previously served as executive vice president and president of Legal Services Corporation, administering federal funding to civil legal aid organizations nationwide and a senior vice president for programs of the National Legal Aid and Defender Association. She began her legal career as a civil rights and legal aid lawyer in Mississippi and was a pioneer in providing legal services aid in Mississippi in the 1970s. Martha is a former Reginald Heber Smith Fellow, Stern Family Fund Public Interest Pioneer, White House Champion of Change, and a recipient of the Kutak Dodds Prize and the ABA Section of Litigation John Minor Wisdom Public Service and Professionalism Award. She is a graduate of Oberlin College and University of Michigan Law School and holds honorary degrees from Oberlin and from Millsaps. So welcome, Martha. Martha. 
Rob McDuff is a practicing civil rights and criminal defense attorney and is director of the Mississippi Center for Justice Impact Litigation Project. He has done trials and appeals in several states and has argued four cases at the U.S. Supreme Court involving civil and constitutional rights. Rob has represented African American voters in a number of redistricting cases, including a very prominent current case, which I think you're going to hear a bit more about in a bit, and has handled cases involving police misconduct, prison conditions, free speech, indigent defense, access to court, school prayer, racial discrimination, discrimination based on sexual orientation, and the list goes on. Two redistricting cases led to significant increases in the numbers of black state court judges elected in Louisiana and Mississippi. And he's worked with the MCJ to challenge Mississippi's anti-LGBT legislation from a few years ago, 1523 bill. Rob is a recipient of the International Human Rights Law Group Pro Bono Service Award, the National NAACP 2009 William Robert Ming Advocacy Award, the MCJ 2011 Champion of Justice Award, New Orleans Innocent Projects 2011 Outstanding Co-Counsel Award, Magnolia Bar Association 2014 R.S. Brown Award, um, the Mississippi ACLU's Ernst Borinsky Civil Libertarian Award, and the list goes on and on, right? He, he is a well-decorated attorney. He's a native of Hattiesburg and a graduate of Millsaps College and Harvard Law School. Let's welcome Rob. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so at this point, I'm going to move on over to the table, and we're going to get this conversation started. Sound good? All right. All right, Tim, you all ready? <laughs> Great, so it's been fun. We've been talking on the phone and a bit last night about our plan for this evening, and uh, we have a plan, but who knows, right? That things sometimes can be uh, adapted as needed. But we did talk a bit about how to jumpstart this conversation, and I was reflecting on a class that I was teaching just earlier this week here at Millsaps to, to our undergrads, and we're reading an excerpt from Justice Brandeis, Supreme Court Justice, um, a piece he wrote in 1915 entitled Living Law. And in that piece, he distinguishes social justice from legal justice. And I'm going to read a quick excerpt from this piece that I discussed with my students on Tuesday. And um, we're going to use this as our jumping off point for our conversation together. So again, this is from The Living Law, Justice Brandeis, 1915. Has not the recent dissatisfaction with our law as administered been due in large measure to the fact that it has not kept pace with the rapid development of our political, economic, and social ideals. In other words, is not the challenge of legal justice due to its failure to conform to contemporary conceptions of social justice? <clears throat> what we need is not to displace courts, but to make them efficient instruments of justice. So when we were talking a couple of days ago, I asked them what they thought about starting our conversation with something like this. What is the relationship between social justice and legal justice? To what extent should law be used as an active tool to use Brandeis's term here as an efficient instrument of achieving justice? And so I don't know that we discussed order yet, but um, who wants to jump in and try to reflect on this sort of big picture theoretical question, but to start grounding it in your own work and life and practice? Okay. <laughs> well, it, it's kind of appropriate that we should be talking about this question on the Millsaps campus because uh, for me, I can sort of trace my whole sort of involvement with that question uh, right to this very place. I first moved to Jackson at age four and lived just a couple hundred yards from here, uh, as was earlier mentioned, on Faculty Row. Uh, and certainly around my dinner table, questions of you know what is justice uh, came up uh, with a father who was more was interested in both the philosophical and even theological um, aspects of that, as well as the practicalities of that. But for me personally, I, my uh, it was the civil rights movement in the 1960s that marked me uh, for life. I, that started school and went all through the Jackson Public Schools, all white uh, segregated schools at that time, uh, pledging allegiance every day uh, to that uh, ideal of justice for all, even while all around me was raging a fierce battle over the system of racial apartheid that really made a mockery uh, of that pledge. Um, so I went to law school uh, to become a civil rights lawyer. I was hoping to 
do my part to dismantle Jim Crow. Uh, and in my youthful idea, you know, with my youthful naivete, uh, I actually was a little worried that I was gonna, it was gonna be too late by the time I got my law degree. <laughs> 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 really, the work was all be done. Uh, I need not have worried. Uh, and I ended up in Hattiesburg with a group of fellow University of Michigan Law School, School graduates, including one in this room, Allison Steiner, and another of whom is my husband, Elliot Andelman, uh, and opened a civil rights practice in Hattiesburg. And we litigated, you know, some uh, impact uh, cases in employment discrimination and voting rights and uh, education uh, issues, housing, uh, and I want to talk as we get into, after we sort of share as we agreed we would, some sort of personal um, Yeah, I think I kind of, of jump straight to the substance. Yeah, in, in this um, opening period, please do feel free to bring in a person. To bring in, so, but it does apply to, I think, how, I, you know, I personally received um, my curiosity about what is justice and, you know, how do we achieve justice, what does that actually mean? both in a philosophical way, but really my life has been about the practice of that and the practical uses of the law um, to do, as Justice Brandeis said, to uh, to make sure that, that law is the thread that, uh, as a society, helps us uh, make sense of and, and get fair resolutions to uh, the controversies and the, and the disputes that we inevitably come in contact with. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm really um, struck by the, the, what Justice Brandeis was talking about the failure to conform to contemporary conceptions of social justice, and I think there he was talking largely about the fact that the treatment of workers in, in, in the factories, that the society was becoming more and more industrialized. Um, was something that people were realizing was a huge problem, but the, the courts and the law were not keeping up with that and were enforcing sort of the, the notion of freedom of contract in a very, a very rigid way. But here we sort of, in Mississippi and in the South, we're really dealing, we're enforcing laws that in many cases are opposed by a majority of the population, specifically the white population. And so when you're talking about the Brown versus Board decision, the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, um, the, the various various present day laws, and even you know the Equal Protection Clause and the and the, and the Free Speech Clause itself, it might not command a majority of support from the majority population, which is which is white. So we often find ourselves. <coughs> enforcing laws and enforcing constitutional principles in local courts that in some sense really aren't popular. Um, and that's, that's sort of part of what <laughs> attracted me to the whole enterprise is, um, and I think the, a lot of people in this room are sort of the same way. I know Martha is, they're just sort of rebellious by nature. Um, and, uh, so, yeah, I, and I grew up, I'm, I'm gonna repeat a little bit of what I said last night, so I apologize for you here, but I grew up in Hattiesburg, and, um, and actually one of my great experiences was when I came back home during law school, and I invited Martha Bergmark to lunch, and she was already at in the Coney Island Cafe, if anybody's ever been there. And um, she had, because I'd taken a, a, a philosophy course from her father here at Millsaps, and so uh, she was really, talking to her about, about her practice and just uh, the things she was doing um, in, in a very conservative town of Hattiesburg. It was very inspiring. But I, um, I grew up in a fairly sheltered environment. And I mentioned in the, the last night, but I want to say it again, I was reading a newspaper article about the trial of the Klansman who killed Vernon Damer, which actually that was a that was one of the few instances when, when the Klansmen were actually prosecuted not long after the crime by uh, uh, Jimmy Dukes and, and uh, Jimmy Finch, of all people. But, um, and, and, some, and I was reading about the trial, I was reading about the courtroom and what the lawyers were making, 
the arguments they were making. Now, what, is, what is the courtroom about? What is what does the lawyer do? Um, and I wondered also why did they kill this man? And so from that, I got interested in court and in, in courtrooms and trials. And I went down, I go down in high school, I go down to the courthouse and watch trials after school. Uh, but also got interested in civil rights. And now this was at a time when the schools were being desegregated. Uh, beginning with freedom of choice when I was in fifth grade, one, one African-American uh, child came to our school and it steadily increased until we sort of had full desegregation beginning in the 10th grade. But, so I was aware, it, learning through that process and then just reading about the civil rights movement, uh, which I was unaware of, even though it was going on in my hometown, the Klan activity was going on in my hometown. So then uh, when I went to Millsaps and had this uh, uh, sociology field project with the Lawyers Committee down on Ferris Street, and then later we worked part-time there and really learned about civil rights law and voting rights law and redistricting, and um, just had, had some wonderful experiences there. And I remember the lawyer, Frank Parker, who some of you know, who's my main boss. One day he came down, he had typed up his petition, came it down to hand it to uh, one of the people uh, on the staff to retype it. And he was bounding back down the hall to go up the stairs and all he said, motion for preliminary injunction, ride on, go get them. And I just thought, this, this is what I want to do. <laughs> and, and it was that exposure that really, uh, really made me want to be and to become a civil rights lawyer. I do other, I'm, I'm too much of a dilettante to just do that, so I do, I do criminal defense and I do a little of this and a little of that, but the main focus of, of my practice is civil rights law, where we're sort of you know, trying, trying to enforce uh, legal norms and anti-discrimination norms, even though, even in some situations where it's not, you know, not entirely popular. Obviously, it's a lot easier now than it would have been in you know, the early 60s. Uh, and, and in the 50s when your father and Ed King and so many others were doing things to, to change society along with you know, so many so many African American Mississippians who are real heroes. Uh, but uh, it's still it's still we are really pushing against against the tide <coughs> down here. One thought I had as, as we sort of prepared for this and each of us, Rob and I both have our stories of who inspired us and why that was so important and uh, what we chose to do and, and to become. One of the ways that Rob and I, we, our lives have intersected in various ways, but importantly, uh, in the creation of the Mississippi Center for Justice in 2002 or so, uh, what we were addressing then was the fact that yes, Mississippi had had Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and the Legal Defense Fund and other national groups that opened up offices on Fair Street to uh, be the legal arm of the civil rights movement. Uh, but by 2000, all of them were, well, by 1980 actually, uh, all of them were gone. And what was truly uh, unacceptable to us uh, and a group of lawyers who helped make this happen. Uh, it was just unacceptable to us that Mississippi should have no homegrown uh, capacity uh, to, to provide legal, legal assistance to systemic and social justice um, issues that obviously still needed attention. So that was really the origin of the, the idea for the, the Mississippi Center for Justice. And it took us a while. Uh, the first major benefactor is in the room, Stacey Ferraro, uh, as well as the uh, lawyers who were on the board and who uh, formed the first staff. And one of the things that makes me happiest about the Mississippi Center for Justice is that it is still today a place where people like Rock can show up and be interns and become young lawyers and have those early experiences. There's nothing, we've all had, we've both had long careers and yet, I can tell you from you know 50 years difference, d distance, it's those early formative experiences that shape you that uh, matter so much to, to shape a career. And if we have time, I'll get to what I'm talking working on now that it, that ties right back to those uh, those early learnings of what was unjust about what we wanted to see change, and then uh, figures of inspiration who taught us how 
we could change it too. So that's exciting. And, and I'm the I'm the person I'm the I'm the person who persuaded Martha to come be the director of the Mississippi Center for Justice. She was living up in Washington D.C. and I've said that. It's like, it's like the invention of the internet. A lot of people claim to have done that. <laughs> I, was one, I was one who was responsible for that. Happy development. That's something that I would uh, be proud of, though, to be sure. So, uh, Martha, let's build on what you were just saying, your current work. Um, the awards program, this, this is called the Nussbaum Civil Justice Awards Center. I think that in the title of this award, civil justice is meant in a broad sort of way, but I think what Martha's going to share with us is her work related to civil justice in a very concrete, specific way. Criminal justice reform has gotten a fair bit of media attention and increasing bipartisan support, I think you can say, in recent years. Um, but the civil justice system is um, not on as many people's radar, but it is on Martha's radar, and I think she's going to share a bit with us now. It's a good time to get into that. You know, I mentioned days in Hattiesburg litigating uh, federal, usually federal court, you know, just systemic litigation to make kind of big changes. But what was just as eye-opening for me about being a young lawyer in Hattiesburg was recognizing how the civil justice system itself was an, a, a tool of oppression uh, for people in the community. That the civil justice system itself uh, was, uh, was delivering injustice uh, in ways that kept people down in really important ways. And I, I, the story I wanna share is actually about Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, someone who I didn't get to know personally, but certainly as a figure of influence, but it's, da it's da our friend David Lippman's story. Uh, David Lippman eventually joined the ranks of sort of legendary Mississippi civil rights lawyers, but it, in this story, he had just gotten to Mississippi. He was wet behind the years as a young legal aid lawyer in the Delta, and uh, Mrs. Hamer called him and said, I want you to come over to Ruleville. Uh, I've got a case for you. Well, David got in his car, of course, immediately and was having visions of the, you know, chain, you know groundbreaking, you know, case that Mrs. Hamer was going to have for him. Um, but he got over to Louisville, and what Mrs. Hay Hamer needed was her friend's couch had been repossessed, and she needed David to get it back. So perhaps she was testing uh, David to see whether he was ready for bigger leagues than the, the local Justice of the Peace Court. But I actually don't think so. I, I think Mrs. Hamer knew perfectly well uh, that as long as the small claims civil courts were wrongfully, uh, you know, part of this furniture company's effort to, to strip this woman of her meager assets, that we were not gonna fix things. You know, she's known as her, uh, you know, a voting rights uh, legend, and yet she was also concerned about the very mundane, everyday, routine uh, ways that civil courts mattered. So today, fast forward to today, we now have a handful of uh, giant debt buying corporations who are swamping the dockets of small claims courts across the country, and I'll give a Massachusetts example, nine debt buying companies file 43% of civil claims in Massachusetts today. They have swamped the, and this is a national story, um, and it's their, it's their business model. They are uh, doing what, you know, the foreclosure crisis of, of 2008, the robo, the robo signing and all that, we have the same thing today. This is giant debt buying with little attention to whether the debt is actually owed, uh, whether the proof can be made, but they're using the court with robo-signed affidavits and uh, sewer service of process uh, to, to basically make collection of whatever they can get. And then, and then that turns into stripped bank accounts and uh, garnishments and truly wreaking havoc in the lives of very low-income people to begin with. Uh, people who, by and large, have defaulted on those uh, when when they if they get served at all, 
Uh, they probably have never heard the company that filed the suit. They may not know, they may think, well, that's really not me. I don't know anything about that. Many stories about the consequences of that kind of use of the civil courts. Another example of, the, of today's use of civil courts in ways that just need to be fixed uh, has to do with the fact that no longer are most people represented by lawyers. It is now the rule, not the exception, that to find yourself in court without legal counsel. Three in four uh, civil cases in the United States today, uh, one, or ne one or neither of the parties is represented. So it's now the exception. And especially where there is representation on one side and not on the other, as in these debt collection cases I'm talking about, or eviction cases across the country, um, there's the imbalance of power means that it's the wealthy and the, and the represented who have the courtroom advantage in civil courts today. Similarly, in family court, I mean, there, the fact that um, it's expensive to hire a lawyer uh, means that most something like 90% of cases uh, in, in domestic court, various kinds of family court matters, uh, we find people there with one or both parties unrepresented. So we have a crisis in the civil court system that is uh, really unrecognized, uh, for the, or beginning to be recognized, uh, but needs, needs our attention. So let me find, and there are solutions. I know people don't wanna hear about new problems. Uh, don't we have enough to worry about already? Um, and yet there, there are solutions and this is, even courts are starting to recognize that this is not an acceptable uh, circumstance and that the, um, the stories we read about, about folks who, who can't make ends meet and who are finding their uh, way to poverty and sometimes to prison uh, because of that, uh, some of that starts with this situation in civil courts. Great, thanks Mark. Is this something you'd like to, to weigh in on at this point, Rob? He's uh, against Belknap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've got, I, I just got calls yeah. from some of those yeah. collect, debt collection companies yeah. and say they need a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so, Martha, I don't know if you want to spend too much time on it, but you said there are some possible solutions. Do you mind the gesturing towards some of them? Certainly. I, you so know, people don't find themselves too terribly depressed. Too terribly. Yeah, exactly. So, the one really strong promising thing is that the chief justices of the state supreme courts are on on this issue finally you know it's it's taken a while courts don't change very fast if you walk in a courtroom today uh it's not unlike what was happening in england you know close magna carta we have not we're not the medical industry by any means uh, we so but that is one of the solutions for us we are it is uh, we don't, if you think of healthcare system and you need to see a doctor, you don't see the doctor right away. You have a, you know, a, a physician's assistant that uh, works on you. You've got nurses, you've got, so in the, in the legal profession, one of the reforms that we do see starting to happen in some places is the recognition that you don't necessarily need somebody with a law degree uh, handling every aspect of, of a case. Uh, there are, right here in Jackson, the Mississippi Center for Justice is uh, working on a, a court navigator uh, program using law students, but they wouldn't even, they just need to be trained personnel who can help you through justice court with small claims. Um, that's an example of, and we find bar associations resisting sometimes. There are what are called unauthorized practices of law, uh, rules and statutes, and there's a real tension between those or whether those are protecting the monopoly that the, the guild of the legal profession holds versus is that a consumer protection uh, provision that keeps you from being uh, ripped off by somebody who doesn't know what they're doing. So th there, there's policy to be, uh, to be addressed there and yet we're seeing that we just, it's not an acceptable situation and when the chiefs of the Supreme Courts start issuing resolutions like they did three years ago to say we need to be pushing toward a system that uh, provides help to people to navigate our system, that our system is needs to be simplified, modernized, uh, made more accessible. So uh, that's a start and we're seeing there are about seven states that have actually said we want to be justice for all states. So the, those chiefs are the in the lead 
uh, of saying major change needs to come here. So we're starting to see that bubble up. There does have to be more funding. There has to be funding for legal aid uh, services. There has to be funding for courts to make the kinds of changes they need to make. Um, and technology is providing solutions. We've seen um, TurboTax is, you know, kind of the, the iconic program that lets you help yourself with something that's formulated and difficult and legal and all of that. Uh, but there are examples where that's coming into being for things like bankruptcy, for getting protection orders in domestic violence situations, etc. So where's the, there's reason for, for hope. Great. So I, I feel a little less impressed. Good. <laughs> Good. Uh, Rob, maybe let's turn our attention to you for a, a moment, if that sounds all right. Uh, I referenced in the bio that you have a, a current uh, voting rights case, gerrymandering the Senate District 62. It's garnered a fair bit of media attention. 22. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's garnered a fair bit of media attention in, in recent weeks. Um, this is, in, in many respects, related to long-standing sorts of work that you have done related to voting rights. In our conversation before, we said this. We want to be a little careful not to provide you know an hour-long tutorial on the Voting Rights Act post Shelby, but uh, I think now is our opportunity to reflect a little bit on this particular case that you're working on, or perhaps a little bit more broadly about the state of voting rights um, in America today. So sure, I uh, I told Kenneth that uh, years after I graduated law school, Howard Bavender, who was my political science professor, who's known known and loved by many people in this room. Uh, <laughs> arranged for me to come back and speak at the Friday Forum, right at that podium there, uh, on, and, and he said, whatever you want to talk about. I said, well, I'm, you know, working on voting rights, so let me talk about voting rights law, and I sort of prepared my outline, and I said, oh, well, I need to make sure I mention this, and oh, I got to explain this and this. And the speak, it was like an hour session, and I was still banging on it, you know, within an hour and 20 minutes, mm -hmm. and I guess it was the, in, a, in a lifetime that's included, um, a few, quite a few boring speeches. This was the most boring speech I've ever given, and it was just everybody was just, and Bavender afterwards, who's a very nice person, just said, you yeah, know, that went on a little bit too long. <laughs> so I told him, Redemption. Ken, I'm going to keep the discussion of voting rights short. Um, and entertaining. And, yes, and entertaining. But when I was, um, when I worked at the Lawyers Committee, that was the main thing I worked on was the voting rights case challenging the redistricting of the Mississippi legislature because, um, as many of you may know, of the 174 members of the Mississippi legislature, the first African American in the 20th century was elected in 1967, and he was the only, the only African American member of the legislature for the next eight years. It was 1975 when finally, as a result of this litigation that had been going on and on since 1965, uh, we were really dealing with a recalcitrant lower federal court. Um, three more were elected. And it was 1979 before there were more than four members of the Mississippi legislature out of, a, out of a 174 in the state that's, you know, 35% black. And so I learned there is an intern on how to build, how to, how to build these cases. And so I've done a lot of that since I got out. In fact, I was... Uh, not too long ago, I was out of law school. I was third chair behind Frank and a lawyer named Johnny Walls on the Mississippi Congressional Redistricting case that led to the district that, uh, where Frank, Mike Ashby was elected in 1986 and now Benny Thompson served. But, so I've done this in, in, in various areas of, of, of the South. But I'm now, uh, with the Mississippi Center for Justice, we filed a suit over State Senate District 22, which starts up in Bolivar County and winds down through the Delta and picks up some suburban, some Madison County suburban precincts. And it is 50.8% African American in voting age population. So it appears to be a, and it is technically a majority African American district. But the reality is that you have uh, very poor people up in the Delta, mostly African American, for mostly African American voting precincts, who just as a practical matter, just like poor people everywhere, do not vote as much as the wealthy people uh, who, have been, who have been added to the district from Madison County. And as a result of that, 
This is the, the, the district has, the, the, the white voters have consistently outvoted the African American voters in that district. The district which really should, should be, I mean, African Americans are underrepresented in the Mississippi Senate anyway. 25% of the members are, are African American in the state is 35% <coughs> African American voting population. So here's one more district where there could be, you know, a little step forward towards more balance, um, but the state did it the way they did. And I think knowing that 50.8% was not enough there. So we filed a lawsuit under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, Judge Carlton Reeves agreed with us and agreed that it violates the Voting Rights Act because it does not give African Americans a fair chance to elect candidates of their choice in a state where African Americans are underrepresented in the Mississippi Senate. Our opponents, the, the governor and the secretary of state, by the way, the attorney general, Jim Hood, did not take a position in the case. He has not joined the governor and secretary of state's appeal. Uh, but they have appealed um, because it, it, it means that district will probably go from Republican to Democrat, white to African American, we hope it will. And their argument is if the district is 50% African American and voting age population, that's enough. That automatically satisfies the Voting Rights Act. And you know, you were talking about sort of uh, the legal formalism that Justice Brandeis was criticizing. I mean, that is a sort of a legal formalism as you say, okay, 50% is enough without any evaluation of, of, of the circumstances that surrounding the, real, the political reality on the ground, which is that the, that the African American voters are constantly outvoted, consistently outvoted, because white voters, generally speaking, will not support African American candidates in Mississippi. And you've got these wealthy suburbs that are just really, that are really diluting the African American voting strength. So that case is we won it, the legislature's drawn a new plan, it's not a great plan, but it's enough to, to satisfy the Voting Rights Act. The state still may take one, we're, we're waiting to see, there's still, it's not over yet, we're hoping it's over yet, and that the final elections can be conducted on this new plan, there may be another appeal they try to, uh, to turn that around. But, it's, you know, obviously this is one district that's part of a, of, a, of a much larger issue about voting rights. And we're, um, at the Mississippi Center for Justice, I'm very proud. And, uh, Beth Olansky's here, the advocacy director. And we are, uh, just very quickly, we're launching a project to really monitor the redistricting in the counties and cities of Mississippi after the 2020 census data comes out. And the, one, of my, one of my favorite lines, from any speech ever, it's from, it's from Dr. King's um, I Have a Dream speech where he said, let freedom reign from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado, let freedom reign from the curvaceous slopes of California, let freedom reign from the mighty hills of New Hampshire. And he said, but not only that, let freedom reign from uh, Stone Mountain in Georgia, let freedom reign from Lookout Mountain, Tennessee, and let freedom reign from every hill and mobile hill in Mississippi, which I think is, is a great description in so many ways. <laughs> But our, uh, our hope is to, is to sort of protect voting rights in every hill and mole hill in Mississippi by really monitoring, by really making a database of the districting plans in all the 82 counties in the larger cities. And then when the redistrictings occur after the 2020 census, try to, try to see where, where people are trying to turn the clock back and trying to, to, uh, you know, to go backwards in terms of African American voting strength and be there to, to fight against that in the legislative process, in the county boards of supervisors, and where it happens to be there with lawyers to challenge it under the Voting Rights Act. So. Great, if it's okay, I think I wanna ask just a quick follow-up that'll bring us back to something we were discussing earlier. In many respects, Brandeis's observations dealt with the responsiveness of law, right? Is law responsive to political majority? Um, Voting, ideally, involves a significant measure of representation. You wanna make sure that different voices are represented in the democratic process in the formation of law. How sanguine are you about the American system in general right now regarding law's responsiveness to the people? It seems like, and, and maybe that gets us into too big of questions, but there has been, after the 2013 Shelby decision when the Voting Rights Act was significantly Deluded, to, to say the least, 
Um, we have seen uh, increased measures that appear to be um, limiting people's access to, to the vote, and it seems to be, in certain respects, taking a step back in uh, ensuring laws responsiveness to the people. <coughs> Are you optimistic that we're going to eventually sort this out? Um, I mean, you're doing great work on the ground, to be sure. But I mean, you talk with your friends in other states about what they're experiencing. There have been a number of federal court cases as well as state court cases in recent years dealing with gerrymandering, the way districts are drawn. This is something that many of you have no doubt followed in the news. How concerned should we be about some of these recent developments? Very. <laughs> My sanguinity has been uh, dissipating ever since, you know, the first week of November in 2016. So, uh, well, and I, I would say about that, too, that uh, ever since that day, uh, I've been reflecting on the fact that I and many friends and some of you in this room uh, went into various kinds of uh, legal practice that was about changing the law, using the courts uh, for that. Um, and it's been a long, uh, many decades now since the federal courts have, have uh, changed over time and moved rightward. And we really, I think, neglected the electoral uh, arena. Uh, you know, I never, it never dawned on me to run for office or uh, or much encourage other people to do that either. We, we've made that such an unappealing um, thing to do in so many ways. And yet I think we did see in beginning in 2017, uh, you know, and with the 18 election cycles, a huge outpouring of interest in and activism around running for office and taking back seats. So there are 7,000 uh, legislative districts in the country, Senate and House, State House districts. Of those 7,000, uh, since 2010, uh, the Republicans have won over 1,000 of those seats. So very significant uh, transition from R, from D to R in state house districts. So there is, was real concern with the, you know, this current electoral cycle to be paying attention to that and to the fact that often it's what's got goes on in state legislatures that really matters. We need, of course, to, got to pay attention to Congress as well, and that's happened. But in the, so in, in the, beginning with Virginia in 17, uh, where there was just a real grassroots, you know, women, all kind of folks running for office, running for state office, uh, there was in that one electoral cycle in 17, uh, just a remarkable uh, shift uh, of seats, um, Sort of back the other way, and the immediate consequence, the immediate result of that was the expansion of Medicaid in Virginia. So it was the, one of the early, more southern, somewhat southern. I don't think of Virginia as all that southern, frankly, but <laughs> sort of southern um, states to, to expand Medicaid. So and other very concrete results of that change. And then with the 18th cycle, we've now seen so those thousand seats that that transition to a way more sort of conservative um, viewpoint in state legislatures, about 400 have now transitioned back, almost not quite 400, have transitioned back to the, to the D column. So we're seeing some very significant shifts. And you know, really, that's what democracy is about. Certainly the courts are a, you know, a third branch and a, and a very important way that we affect policy, um, but the electoral pieces cannot be neglected. I mean, that's just uh, so important. So Mississippi now, we're, we have an election year this year, only four states in the country have, um, have elections this year. So there's gonna be a lot of attention on us. There's a, there are more Democratic candidates that file. There are several districts in our um, legislative uh, battles that are that are now contested at least you know if you, if, uh, if only one person runs for office that's who's going to win so there are there are going to be some interesting races I think uh, this year uh, here right here and of course the the, the, the courts are the federal courts are dramatically affected by the election as we know in just a few 
thousand votes in you know Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania, we'd have a very different different federal, a different Supreme Court, a very different federal lower courts than we have now, and we'll see what happens in 2020. But uh, that's the impact of Trump's appointments, even if he has only one term, uh, are going to be with us for a long time. Yeah. I think one of the things that's striking about both of you and people who are involved in this sort of work is it seems like there is a lot of evidence that consistently presents itself that should give you reason to be disheartened and discouraged, but nevertheless, you continue <laughs> to put your head down and continue to go to work. And uh, I think that's something that all of us, I trust all of us, feel uh, inspired by. So thank you for all that, that good work that you have done. What are other current issues that you're concerned about, that you're focused on? Uh, before too long, I know we need to start thinking about switching over to the audience for your Q&A time, but, but what other issues keep you awake at night or do you plan on the next stage in your career to focus on or you want to make sure that are on our agenda that may not occur? Well, I, I started out by saying that it was really the civil rights movement that marked me and influenced the course of my life. But as I think about the uh, events that have been defining for others who've come after me, uh, you know, whether that's 9-11 uh, and, uh, in fact, Kenneth mentioned that in a conversation we had about that is, it, he has students who are young enough not even to remember 9-11, let alone the civil rights <laughs> let alone the civil Yeah, that makes you feel old. <laughs> <laughs> so we were yeah. talking about his youth, and he said, I'm not so young anymore. That was his, uh, that It hit me a couple of years ago. I was talking about 9-11, Patriot Act, something like that, and I realized not a single student in my <laughs> class had any recollection whatsoever of September 11th. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. And yet, whether it's the dreamers, you know, so the people who are inspiring activism today, uh, in addition to Donald Trump, uh, are the dreamers, uh, I think, are, are cause for hope in, you know, in what's going to really motivate, or the gun violence activists forged in tragedies like Parkland and elsewhere. Um, so I, I do think there are, uh, you know, these events that happen that, that just influence us, and, and as we when we get to the point where we have the luxury of looking back decades, we can see, well, that's what, uh, that's why I'm who I am, that's why I do what I do, that's why I care about this. So the issues go, the issues are go on and on, but I, I guess I take hope from, I fundamentally do believe that the arc of history is long, but it bends toward justice. Uh, so that gets me up every day. But, there, but there's plenty to worry about, as you know, and I do think elector, I would say what I already said, that elect the, the attention to running for office, I'm now telling everybody, you know, why don't you run for office, you know, everybody who's yeah. younger than me, that is. Um, so that's one of the important ones. The, um, and you know, I just think back about, to when I was a child, the sort of obstacles that, that were faced by so many particularly African-American people in the state and the, and the people who were working for change, mostly African-American, but also some white people as well, like, like Dr. Bergmark and Ed King and Rems Barber, Dr. Lewis and so many others. Uh, the, 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 the difficulties we have now pale in comparison to what they were fighting against. Uh, and so I, you know, the, I, don't, I don't lose any sleep. I just think we've got, you know, we've got some challenges, but it's, uh, it's good to be taking them on and, not, not as not as bad as it could be, and we just try to make it better. Right. I did think I did hear on the radio on a, a piece that really struck me that uh, it was talking about different rights that we think we ha that we think we have that we claim under our you know American ideal, and so the one that this commentator mentioned was the right to get up and leave. Um, so the and that America really. It is what it is today because people got up and left other places that you know were not welcoming and so forth. Uh, and yet we have uh, a world, you know, where refugee populations are exploding, you know, and, and we're feeling it ourselves. I was telling Amelia McGowan, uh, one of those Mississippi Center for Justice lawyers who's here yesterday, that I just wasn't aware, as I should have been, of uh, you know what the 
the immigration crisis really means and the, the request for asylum is sort of taking over the, uh, that. So I think that's one, I, that's one area where I hope the Mississippi Center for Justice can um, step up to that battle. I think that's, a, that's really a today issue that, um, it's very easy to, I mean, I live in the Washington DC suburbs in an area that's highly you know, populated by uh, immigrants and the people who work in my yard, and, you know, all that. You know, we, we're sort of touched by it, and yet we can go on about our lives pretty uh, obliviously unless we pay attention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, does it sound all right for y'all if we open it up to audience uh, time here? All right, so I have a question right here at the front. <laughs> you, at the beginning, Martha, you set up a dichotomy between civil justice and criminal justice reform, but it seems to me there is, I think this is the popular term, intersectionality there, particularly, well, the criminal justice system also believes poor people, the families of the inmates and people who are under sentence of great deals of money into private pockets, but there is real, at both in pretrial detention and reentry after incarceration, there is real opportunity for the civil and criminal justice reform movements to work on the same problems. And also, with respect to voting rights, re-enfranchisement, one of the things that suppresses voting <coughs> most profoundly among African American men <coughs> is any, pretty much any felony in Mississippi, though at least telling me once he served his time. So talk maybe about, hopefully, about how the intersectionality can be used to forge a united place. I think that the, it's one of the most exciting things that has happened recently is the attention to the criminal justice crisis. And it crosses, I think it's, you know, there's been bipartisan uh, interest in that and so forth. So. What I think happens on the civil side is there's just what, and research actually shows that people do not, yeah, if you've been charged in a, with a crime, you kind of get it that you're involved with the criminal justice system. But you can have a life problem, a very serious life problem without really realizing that it's legal at all. So I do think there's a sort of an awareness uh, issue. I mean, I deal with reporters every day who are covering substantive issues that are covering domestic violence or immigration or whatever, but they're, they're sort of oblivious to the fact that law is even in that conversation or that legal advocacy, you know, needs to be there. So I think we're, uh, you know, we who kind of toil on the civil justice side work, have to work against that, uh, that circumstance. So I'm hopeful that we can sort of take the attention that there is right now to criminal, the criminal justice situation and help raise awareness on the civil side as well. So I think you're exactly right. There, and it, not only is there the intersectionality of the systems, but the people it affects are the very same. I mean, it's, you know, uh, there, there's no difference there. So we, what we don't yet have, and I, I think for the reasons I just said, there is no popular uprising to say, this is enough, we are to stop this, you know, use of, the civil courts for debt collection. Where there's no in eviction, we're starting to see a bit of that, you know, in the big cities uh, because housing prices are just what they are. So we, we see some activism, some community activism, a little bit around that. But I think we're a long way from and need to use the attention on criminal justice uh, to say, yeah, this it is one system of justice we've got. Yes, we can sort of silo it a little bit so, so we say, oh no, I don't do that criminal stuff. And yet we do really because of all the reasons you very eloquently stated. And to interject myself here for just a moment, to your point about voting rights, to connect your question about felon voting rights and voting more generally, I'm sure many of us in the room are aware that Florida just last year um, essentially re-enfranchised billions of voters by using the process by which former felons are given the right to vote. But 
what you might not have seen, we released just yesterday afternoon our latest state of the state survey that we and Millsap do in partnership with Chisholm Strategies. And I was just pulling this up on my phone that 70% of Mississippi voters favor easing the process by which voting rights are restored to former felons. And only 26% believe that felons should lose their voting rights forever, unless pardoned by the governor. And we have actually a lawsuit, MCJ, um, against, to, to declare as unconstitutional the 1890 dis provision disqualifying people for if they've been convicted of certain felonies. Now, most people don't know this, or many people don't know it. In Mississippi, there are a, only a subset of felonies disqualifies people from voting. And they're mostly nonviolent. The murder and rape is, is part of it now, was added in 1968. But most of them are things that are, are theft crimes, perjury, bigamy, arson, crimes that the 1890 framers of the Constitution thought were disproportionately committed by African Americans because this was a tool as part of the, as part of the arsenal of tools in the 1890 Constitution to take away the vote from African Americans who had gained it after the Civil War. And so we are suing over that, and we were hoping the legislature was gonna take some steps, and there was a bill to create a study committee to reform the disfranchisement laws um, that ended up going nowhere. But I think most people, I think you just mentioned, Allison, most people who come out of prison with felony convictions think they can't vote even if they were convicted of some crime other than the disqualifying crimes. Um, and so that most, most people don't register because they don't think it's, it's possible. But hopefully we can get, you know, we we're hoping to win this case and use that to spur, uh, just to, you know, to spur reform, but we'll see. All right, who's next? Steve in the middle. Um, I'm very sympathetic to the idea that we should support legal services for our citizens better, and, and that would mean spending more as a country on law. But I'm curious, what are we up against in trying to claim some bigger part of that pie of what the country spends money on for legal services? Do you have any idea how we compare with other richer countries in proportionally how much we spend on our justice system? We are rich, we write abysmally. I, you know, I, I didn't come prepared with it. We're like 40th on the, there's a national, an international um, study that's done on various indicators, and one of them is access to justice. And we're down there with Uganda and, I don't know, Honduras or something. I, it's, it's really bad. But, the, but the, the current president of the Legal Services Corporation likes to, use this stat, which is in the United States, we spend on civil legal aid uh, less than Americans spend every year for Halloween costumes for their pets. <laughs> and it's, it's a true statistic. Um, Americans spend a little, about a little over 500000 a year on costume, Halloween costumes for their pets. And the current uh, federal appropriation for legal aid is 410 days. So we have quite a long way to go, and we have an argument to make that we really, you know, we're such a pittance that really it's not going to cost that much more to increase it rather significantly. But the answer is not going to be, you know, the, the federal, at one time we all thought, oh well, this should be the federal, you know, federal government took it on under, in 1966, under, uh, Lyndon Johnson's part of his war on poverty, and it's been there ever since. It sort of clings to life in certain political eras, but it's there. Um, but what we've seen is that it's the answer is not going to be just that. It's it's happening at state levels, uh, and states like Texas, interestingly, are in the very lead, largely because their chief justice there is absolutely committed to this. Uh, on state funding, it, you know, these are state courts, these are state legal parties, it, it really is more uh, arguably a function of state government than it is in state courts than, than perhaps U.S. But I think the, if we all chipped in, if we, if we had the federal government stepping up, if we had state governments stepping up, if we had philanthropy and private donations, I mean the Mississippi Center for Justice 
you know, lives on donations from many of you in this room. Thank you very much, and please keep doing it. Because <laughs> uh, it's way more fragile than you know, this capacity. It's not, it's, it, it needs all of our help. So it's, it is that sort of partnership that's going to help us step up. And I think we're also solving it in some ways issue by issue. You know, as you see that women who are subjected to domestic violence can get no help even for uh, their situations uh, to get out of their, you know, get their families into personal safety, that they have no legal help. Uh, we see cities and we see states who are just funding that. And that's a start, you know, so, so it's, but ideally you would, yes, you would probably appropriate at least 10 times the, the funding for it. But it's a, it is really a matter of political will. Yep. Um, I wanted to ask you because you seem to both be talking about maybe um, a lack of access to representation and you know, legal advocacy and so forth. And maybe is it because there are fewer law students or graduates of law schools going into work, working for things like the Center for Justice as opposed to going into corporate law? I mean, I'm thinking about how you've seen a big decline in the number of the best college graduates going into education, for example, to be teachers, which is kind of a partnership to me with the legal system. Um, you know, and, and is it because maybe, and this is just my opinion, but I think you know, from maybe the 60s until recently, we've seen sort of a, a lack of sense of moral outrage about a lot of things in the country that inspired people like you all you know, go there into that field of work back then. I think it's changing now with, you know, as you said, gun control issues and environmental issues on the part of young people, the dreamers and all that. But do you, do you think there is a lack of, uh, of interest in going into that kind of work? And if so, what could be done? No, I think there's a, people are going to law school today and, and law schools primarily help support it now in a way that they certainly did when I went, we went to school so much. Um, so the jobs, but the jobs aren't there. You know, in, 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 this, in our sector, in the sort of nonprofit uh, public interest law, jobs are at a tremendous premium. So they're, they're hard to get, you know, and they're not, uh, they don't pay as much as they need to pay because we don't just, what Steve says, we don't, you know, we're not putting uh, the resources uh, into it. But clearly people are still, you know, going to law school for reasons that Rob and I did. Uh, and more so, I think. But the jobs would be there if there were more funding for them? Of course, yes, yeah. absolutely. I mean, the limitation there, I, I can't, I'm not any, any expert on the legal industry <laughs> uh, and what's happening with jobs, but, and I know there was, you know, law schools are shrinking because of post uh, recession, et cetera. You know, there's, there's a whole, you know, world of me legal media out there that you could read up on that. But I think in our little sector alone, there are only 10,000 legal aid lawyers in the entire country. There are 1.3 million lawyers, 1.3 million, 10,000 of them are civil legal aid lawyers, and about 10,000 are defenders. That's it. So we're not over-resourcing this, you know, this, uh, and, and that's to serve the vast majority of Americans, you know. So it's, we're way out of whack. This is anecdotal, but I graduated from Yale Law School in 2012, so not that long ago, and a lot of my classmates, I think, would have been very interested in going into this sort of work, but it's hard to find good jobs. And there is a sort of default trajectory. The big firms come to the law schools and they interview you the fall before your senior uh, second year to get you a summer job after your second year, and they pay you $3,500 um, a month um, or, or more, $3,500 a week, week, I mean, week. Um, <laughs> for some people who have never really made much money at all, oftentimes. Um, and then and by don't the end of the summer, don't have to do anything. Don't have to do anything. I mean, I was paid $3,500 a week by a big firm in DC. I had no clue what I was doing, right? <laughs> and I didn't even have a degree. Um, and then by the end of the summer, they give you a, an offer to come back, making that sort of salary or more on a permanent basis. All the while, if not until nine months later, that there's a chance that a public interest firm may give you a shot at a job, but typically, 
what they would say was, well, we can't, we don't have the capacity to train you. So what you need to do is work for three years at the big firm, get your litigation skills in order or whatever it might be, and then come back to us. But of course, if you do that for three, four, five years, you get a cousin making four or five times what your salary might be in legal aid, and you get a family and a house and a car and all this, that, and the other, and then it's when the job does open up, like, man, that would be really great, but. So that, that's one anecdotal piece of information about it. Uh, Tom, can you take a minute to talk about your communication research and what people perceive of their analysts at the LA and what people think about it in the United States? Sure. Um, what we know from public opinion research, at, and that's, we've done that at my organization, Voices for Civil Justice, is that while people know very have very limited understanding of what is a what is the civil justice system or what's a kind of a need that you might have that would bring you in contact with it, so they're pretty ignorant about that. Uh, they evidently missed civics uh, altogether in high school and junior high, but anyway, and they have very limited knowledge of what is legal aid or that there is even such a program. But as soon as you start to, to mention to them that there is such a program and that there, there are these needs, they are highly supportive. So the bad news is kind of not much awareness of this at all. But the very good news is that the minute you start to educate people, whether in focus groups or through the course of a survey, uh, about, about what this is, they are very supportive. So strong values level belief that equal justice under law is a right, not a privilege. Something like 84% of our polling showed very strong commitment to that. Similarly, high levels that people should have access to help and legal help when they have to navigate the civil justice system. Very much open to a variety of solutions. So you, we kind of define, we, we define now civil legal aid very broadly to include not just the most traditional form of help, which is having that lawyer by your side if you go to court, but also access to online information and uh, teaching judges to speak in plain language and you know modernize the court systems. Uh, very receptive to all of that. So if we if we begin to talk about this and advocate for this, we have very strong support from from the public. All right, I said we were going to try not to go past the round uh, 2.15, but any last uh, question from the audience? Okay, any closing thoughts from our panelists? I think this has been a ton of fun for me, and I know it has been for the audience as well. What, any last uh, words of wisdom, reflections, thoughts, observations from our distinguished team? Y'all been fantastic. Thank you. Do you have anything out there? Just, just yeah. I, I will say, you know, the Mississippi Center for Justice is one of many across the country. There would be others you could go out there and find support. But that is right now our model, you know, for whether whether with some government funding or not, our model for providing this help is organizations like that. Uh, and they do need your support and they need you to know more about them and sign up for our new you know occasional newsletter just so you know about the uh, you'll get a little more inside scoop on uh, what Rob's litigation work is than if you just read your newspaper. Uh, so, so please, that would be my last pitch would be to say, uh, get involved or at least just sign up and be more aware. So. Sounds great. All right, let's give it up for our. Uh,